Expertgruppen för biståndsanalys, EBA, är en statlig kommitté som oberoende analyserar och utvärderar svenskt internationellt bistånd för att det ska kunna förbättras och utvecklas. EBA har tio ledamöter med kompetenser från olika biståndsområden och ett kansli som verkställer besluten. Förutom våra rapporter så ordnar vi seminarier, workshops och möten mellan olika parter. Varje år sammanfattar EBA sin verksamhet i årsberättelsen Biståndsanalys. Den kan beställas från kansliet eller laddas ner på eba.se. EBA har ett oberoende i relation till uppdragsgivaren regeringen, liksom i relation till vad som utvärderas, samt till de rapportförfattare som anlitas. Rapportförfattarna ansvarar själva för slutsatser och rekommendationer i sina studier. Allt vi producerar som rapporter, seminarier och vår podcast EBA-podden finns tillgängligt på vår hemsida. This EBA webinar on why some donor governments choose to work through recipient governments while others opt to bypass those authorities. A special welcome to Simone Dietrich, whose recent book, States, Markets and Foreign Aid, will be the focus of our discussion today. A warm welcome also to Joachim Molander, one of our discussants, and I will introduce Simon and Joachim to you more fully later. My name is Magnus Lindell. I'm a member of the expert group for aid studies. Uh, I served with CEDA for 20 years in various management positions, both at field level and, and at headquarters, including being CEDA's head of operations between 2008 and 10. More recently, I was head of international affairs at the Swedish National Audit Office. Today, I will be double-hatted as both discussant and moderator of what I hope will be an interesting conversation. Uh, there will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar for everyone to comment and ask questions, um, but I will get back to you with some more instructions later. Now, it's time to introduce Simon. Simon Dietrich is currently Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Geneva. She has previously held various research and teaching positions at the Essex University in the UK, at the Princeton University and the University of Missouri in the US. She holds a PhD in political science from the Penn State University. Now, uh, Simone, in the foreword to your book, you recount an episode from your time as an aid practitioner in Bosnia in the early 2000s. You were involved in the design of a reform package, nicknamed the Bulldozer Initiative, which was about enacting, I think, 50 pieces of legislation in 150 days. And you recall dissenting donor voices in Sarajevo who questioned the wisdom of bypassing local structures and who rather argued for a more patient, long-term approach. And that experience later triggered two interlocking research questions for you. Why do some donors bypass local authorities while others prefer government to government engagement? And why do some donors focus on achieving results while others strive to build capacity? I think that most aid protect pr practitioners have asked themselves those very questions. And now, 20 years later, you have come up with your analysis. We are eager uh, to hear your presentation, Simone. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Magnus, for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to present my book to you today and the audience, and I look forward to uh, the discussions. Now, my book attempts to answer a theoretical and empirical puzzle that Magnus just presented, uh, which asks, why do governments or donor governments, and here I talk about 23 DAC, traditional DAC donors, engage in markedly different development tactics under similar recipient country and international economic conditions? Now, in doing so, and I will argue this later, uh, 
or understanding this, this puzzle will help us grapple with um, challenges around topics such as uh, foreign aid effectiveness, donor coordination, and the creation and proliferation of deaf best developing practices. Now, before, in a first step, let me define what I mean when I talk about different tactics. And here I distinguish between two approaches. On the left side is a picture of a government building in Colum Colombo, Sri Lanka, but it could be really anywhere in the developing world that signifies donor engagement with recipient structures where authorities are involved. This could be uh, budget support, but this could also be project aid that um, involves recipient authorities in the implementation. And this approach brings in local hierarchies, local gravitas, and should make aid more relevant and effective. Uh, bypass is the other tactic, which is a catch-all category for now that includes a range of delivery channels that take on the responsibility for aid implementation in a first instance from the donor. So on the top right is a screenshot of Chemonix, uh, a familiar name in the world of for-profit uh, development. Below you have a picture of CARE International, uh, uh, an international NGO that works with local counterparts around the world. Then uh, there is Gavi, a public-private partnership which promotes private sector in investment in vaccine delivery, or we can imagine logos of IOs or tr their trust funds uh, that have moved into the development space to capture some of the aid uh, that is available while offering management and oversight in the implementation of aid. And one important idea associated uh, with bypass is that it get, gets aid directly to the people, especially in environments where the quality of government uh, or of governance is low and working with the recipient government poses high fiduciary and results risks to donors. Now, I want to point out that both approaches come with trade-offs. Um, let's begin with bypass. A picture on the left uh, is a picture of a PEPFAR clinic in Mozambique that treats a young patient uh, that is, that is sick with HIV AIDS. As you probably know, PEPFAR is a targeted vertical health program uh, that is put in place and maintained by the US and its non-state implementing partners. Uh, PEPFAR doctors, I wanna sort of uh, uh, symbolize this in, in the picture, have uh, sufficient equipment, medication, and resources that provide HIV patients with what they need. And in the US, the PEPFAR has long been considered uh, a golden goose in US uh, programming because it satisfies the value for money criterion and makes results uh, very legible. On the other hand, the right side, uh, we see a photo of a government-run clinic that suffers capacity issues, that does not manage to provide adequate treatment for diabetes, or in this particular instance, ensure adequate maternal health care uh, through a women's pregnancy. And so we observe uh, inequality in health structures across uh, recipient countries. And one could even argue that setting up vertical structures like PEPFAR can undermine the broader local health system insofar as it draws away doctors and personnel who get better training and pay uh, in these vertical externally funded programs. And so of course, then th these can have negative effects on broader healthcare structures. Aside from these unintended consequences, let's say, uh, recent research has shown that bypass tactics can in fact uh, affect politics in recipient countries. Bypass aid uh, has been shown to mute popular resistance in dictatorships by subsidizing government spending and thus rendering citizens less willing to openly ch challenge the encumbered through protests or bypass 
may actually cause repressive governments to lash out against implementing actors and potentially um, weaken civil society in the country. And so these are important outcomes that donors care about. Government to government aid uh, also has trade-offs. Um, uh, there is a possibility of aid capture by elites. You've all heard of anecdotes uh, where aid has been associated with the construction of mansions or the purchase of private planes. A recent uh, World Bank uh, study shows that aid disbursements to highly aid dependent countries is associated with sharp increases in disbursements to uh, bank deposits in offshore financial centers known for bank secrecy and private wealth management. Montenola and Kono have shown that aid can actually, or government to government aid, can help autocrats in the long run because they can stockpile aid for use against negative economic shocks that might threaten their grip on power. And in other words, uh, government to government aid can strengthen autocratic rule. And these two are outcomes that donors care about. And from an empirical perspective, if we look at the data across the level of projects or countries, we see that uh, donors position themselves differently on these trade-offs. Um, donors have systematic preferences for more bypass or more engaged. In countries with poor governance, for example, uh, where the possibility of aid capture is high, donors like the United States, uh, the UK, but also Sweden, among others, channel more aid through non-state actors, while donors like uh, Germany or France or Belgium as another smaller donor work more with the recipient government. And these preferences are quite stable over time. Why? Now, my book offers an explanation for this variation. And I look for answers in national structures. And in specifically, I suggest that aid officials inside donor agencies hold the keys to, the, to answering this puzzle. And by looking at the, them and the decisions that they take, we can explain these systematic preferences towards more bypass or more engage across donor countries. But I will say that these decisions have less to do with what the individual official wants to do at any given moment or what the aid industry deems as most effective at any given moment, but rather that this, the pursuit of development or the, these, the choices that are made with regard to bypass or engage um, have domestic historical roots. And they have their origin in how donors address risk or more specifically, how the bureaucratic structures within which they work address risk and how they ensure accountability. And so to understand why the UK bypasses more than Germany today, or why Sweden bypasses relatively more than Belgium, we need to look at these institutional rules and organizational practices. We need to understand why they were uh, put in place and what objectives they seek to accomplish and how these rules then govern the behavior of aid officials. And so um, if we focus on bureaucratic structures, it's, it's important to say that aid institutions, just like all other domestic ministries or, or bureaucratic agencies, uh, were set up or reformed at particular points in time to address certain problems. So if, if you think about the US and, and the UK, um, for example, the, the crisis of the welfare state in the 1960s and 70s led to a significant restructuring of the state and its rule books in the 1980s, uh, including national aid organizations. USAID in the 60s and 70s used to be a very big uh, implementing agency, sending 
its uh, officials across the world today, its function has been reduced from rowing to steering, to borrow from a public administration uh, image, um, and now focuses on managing uh, aid contracts. And in other words, these particular bureaucratic solutions to challenges of, of globalization affect how donors interact with recipient countries and they ultimately thus shape development. And so I distinguish between donors and now I create ideal types um, that, but we certainly, there is a, a continuum in between these types uh, whose national aid bureaucracies operate more on a managerial or neoliberal rule book uh, and those that operate on more traditional public sector logics. Again, uh, to define terms here, when I speak of uh, neoliberal or managerial, I think in particular about the reorganization of public sectors to mimic private sector governance. Um, by the, to that end, uh, these structures impose individual level accountability, they emphasize incentives and competition, and their objective is to minimize risk in aid delivery. And so a key objective of the managerial reform is to make aid legible in the short run uh, by designing targeted manageable projects that are evaluated and measured in regular intervals using quantitative indicators uh, that often black box country uh, contexts. And so the basis of log legitimation of a managerial institution is in large part derived from its specific output, uh, its ability to deliver on the results that it has promised in the most efficient way possible. Now, because there is variation in bureaucratic organization, uh, I expect differences in aid delivery. And there is also an overtime element in this. which is depicted nicely by this cartoon that I titled the neoliberal moment, where bureaucratic reorganization in the process of neoliberal reforms leads to changes in aid delivery, while the recipient government hand reaches out, uh, the official, the UK official in this instance, is prioritizing di direct delivery to the poor. And so this suggests that uh, uh, the development of, I of a hypothesis that predicts variation not only across countries today, but also variation over time within donor countries. So as donors undergo neoliberal uh, reforms, they switch from more government to government engagement towards more bypass. And so, well, the book uh, actually analyzes um, more than 20 donor countries, as I said in the outset, but it does look at five countries in greater depth to trace the causal mechanism. Uh, the link between bureaucratic reorganization and aid delivery practices in Sweden is, is one of them. And uh, alongside the US, the UK, Germany, and France. And while the US uh, and the UK are on the far neoliberal end of the spectrum, I think of Sweden as a hybrid um, where government continues to assume a key role in financing goods and service provision, but where delivery, but delivery is highly marketized or privatized. And if, we, if you looked into this 2013 uh, economist special issue, uh, there is even a quote in there that says uh, that uh, according to the author, Milton Friedman would be more at home in Stockholm than in Washington DC when it comes to the to individual choice. And this is in part due to significant restructuring of the bureaucracy and the introduction of neo, the NPM or managerial uh, practices such as competitive contracting among other reforms. <clears throat> 
And so, so I place, because I focus on bureaucratic organization, I place uh, Sweden on the neoliberal managerial end of the spectrum. Um, and this not only during the tenure of the conservatives, uh, but also throughout uh, social democratic tenure. Now, if uh, I can uh, look, just simply show you uh, my empirical strategy and the, the findings, I, I estimate uh, statistical cross-country analysis uh, across 23 OECD DAC donor countries. I also conduct a series of individual level open and closed ended surveys um, with aid officials uh, across donor countries. Um, and then finally, I investigate the causal mechanism by doing comparative research on the organization of aid bureaucracies across countries and across time for my five uh, cases. And across the levels of analyses, I find that robust evidence for the, my explanation, that is that institutional rule books and variation therein can help us explain stable and market differences in aid delivery tactics. Now, what does this mean uh, for aid effectiveness? I, I promised some insights in this regard at the outset. Uh, on the one hand, the book uh, implies that, or the findings imply that ideological beliefs that were locked in decades ago to solve problems of globalization, so the way that um, Thatcher or Reagan perceived them, continue to influence the way that aid is delivered today. Uh, and not just in, in constraining uh, aid officials, but also by shaping the objectives and the mandate of aid organizations, as well as the met metrics that are used to document aid success. And in a way, uh, it also, or one, one finding that I try to, to work out um, through exchanges with, with aid officials, is that aid officials at any given moment cannot easily optimize or change their tactics or adjust it because of these constraints uh, based on the, the rules framework. Uh, what does this mean for the future of aid? Uh, it means that for new ideas or innovation to be practical, practical and implementable, uh, foreign aid strategies must align with the underlying ideological orientation of the rule books. And so uh, deviating too much from the rule book is perhaps possible for some period of time with the expense of political capital, but the, the constraints or the, the pressures that, that uh, rules impose on aid officials who try to fulfill their mandates uh, will push uh, the, the, the innovation back to its, its ideological origin. Um, this means that stable and, and paradigmatic changes in aid delivery will first require institutional reforms. Uh, and it also implies that political economy is associated potentially with comparative advantage. That is, not all aid organizations are set up to expertly promote capacity building or long-term developments, nor are all aid organizations expertly set up to promote short-term delivery. And in both, neither one is a preferable strategy, in fact, both need to work together and there is uh, potentially room and uh, we hopefully get to discuss this in, in the discussion is when we think about um, donor coordination that there really is uh, room for, for sharing burden uh, down, down the line. And finally, uh, my last slide uh, connects with implications for donor coordination and best practices in development. What I find is that like-minded donors who share the same orientation and whose aid agencies are structured in similar ways uh, 
are more likely to coordinate successfully. For cross-political economy coordination, more political effort is, is necessary. And finally, uh, varied rule books or differences in rule books also can complicate agreements about what constitutes best development practices. And here I uh, open, for example, the, the discussion or the uh, bifurcation in, in, on the one hand, uh, best practices that promote country ownership um, that uh, require a lot of input from uh, recipient countries and on the other hand, organizational performance that ensures that donors are able to uh, document success and, and uh, in, with a view towards um, maintaining uh, public support uh, for aid. And so with that uh, short presentation, I look forward to hearing your reactions and discuss them with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simone, and thank you for condensing your your book in, in uh, 20 minutes time. Um, I will now introduce you to our first discussant, uh, Joachim Molander, has many years of experience in development cooperation from various roles at CEDA and um, Swedish embassies in Rwanda, Burundi, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. He was CEDA's director of, of evaluation for several years, and he also represented Sweden in, in DAX Evaluation Network. He is currently Head of Budget and Program Performance at International IDEA. And Joachim is also a member of the uh, Expert Group for Aid Studies. Joachim, your reflections. Yeah, thank you, Magnus, and thank you, Simona. Um, yeah, I have many reflections, and, but first uh, and foremost, I had the opportunity to read your book as well and listen to the presentation. It's very interesting material, I think. But of course, it's my role here also to ask some challenging questions for discussions. So, so some of our observations that uh, I would like to discuss more and hear your views on is perhaps uh, when you analyze the data. I think it's a it's a very interesting hypothesis that the way we do governance in the donor countries will affect what kind of aid preferences we have. But could there be alternative explanations uh, to why you see these patterns? So I was thinking one thing that I saw from my experience at CEDA, you talk about either working with government or bypass the government for service delivery. But Swedish Development Corporation have, of course, many other objectives than just uh, letting aid deliver services. So for example, you would probably see in your statistics a lot of civil society support. But the main purpose of supporting civil society for Sweden is not for them to deliver services that the government could provide, but rather to de develop civil society's capacity in its own right as a democratic actor. Um, and also you will probably see in your statistics that we use, uh, Sweden use more and more multi-buy aid, that is we support uh, multilateral organizations in the countries and that might look like a bypass solution, but I would argue that a lot of that type of aid is actually uh, using multilaterals for developing state capacities. So you would have, you would give UNDP or UNICEF money to work with state agencies and develop their capacity. And one reason for that is of course that Sweden doesn't have implementing agencies like GIZ, for example. So I don't know if that is something that could maybe um, indicate that you overestimate the bypass solutions of Sweden in particular. And I think, you know, I've been working a little bit with USAID in the past and also when they use private companies like Chemonix, like you argued, that can also, the purpose of that support could be to build state capacities rather than delivering services on the side. So that's a bit of a methodological question and a question to, to how how you analyze that. And that goes to my other comment, uh, which is, uh, I think maybe here, at least if we look at Sweden in particular, we may perhaps also perceive ownership a little bit differently than pure government ownership. So uh, because the state or the country, whatever you want to call it, is of course owned by the people as well, not only government officials. So that would also explain a lot of civil society support and the importance of developing various types of capacity, not only 
uh, government capacity. So, and as you probably know, this was a big debate in Accra, for example, uh, around the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, that it overemphasized the role of government and that you must look at ownership in a broader sense. Uh, so these are two of my main reflections at this point, but we will also have an opportunity to discuss further. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Joachim. Um, now, Simon, I will let you respond to Joachim's points, but I have a few reflections of my own that I would like to share first. Um, now, reading about your book, I reacted very emotionally. Could it really be that Sweden is a neoliberal donor in the same corner as the United States? And in the opposite corner among the do-gooders, uh, we find Germany and France with their armies of technical assistance. I simply couldn't reconcile that picture with my own experience and the various discussions with international colleagues on ownership and partnership and what have you. And when Sweden advocated alignment with national systems or the importance of being on budget, we certainly didn't look towards France and Germany for support. Now, having actually read your book, I must admit that you make a fairly compelling case and you're also very careful not to pass any value judgment on the two competing approaches. You, you rather underline that both come with important trade-offs. Um, but you place Sweden squarely in this managerial or neoliberal camp and you trace the roots uh, of the Swedish model to the public sector reforms of the 90s and the management tools introduced at that time. And you, you argue that the critical juncture was the shift in government in two, 2006 after which you see an escalation of neoliberal instruments in, in the Swedish aid system. Now, from my own perspective, uh, having experienced the political pressures during those years firsthand, I tend to agree that that paved the way for some fundamental changes in Swedish aid practices. However, I'm still a bit hesitant to use that neoliberal label, since I think there can be many routes to this development. But in your book, Sweden provides an illustrative example of how a donor's transition from a traditional to a neoliberal model makes it more probable that that donor will apply bypass um, and shift from long-term focus to increasing emphasis on, on short-term results. And it's quite clear from your data that Sweden tends to avoid cooperating with the state as soon as the terrain gets a bit difficult as opposed to, say, donors like Germany and France, who tend to stick to governments uh, to a much larger extent. Um, but having accepted, in general terms, your analysis, um, there are two issues that I think uh, merit some discussion. Um, the first one concerns results. Uh, you claim that aid success is really in the eyes of the beholder, that it means different things to aid official from different approaches. Aid officials that follow the managerial rule book are more likely uh, to focus on short-term results. Now, that might be true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that ultimate impact is out of sight, does it? Um, and are all bypass scenarios inherently aiming at short-term results? Um, like Joachim, you could, uh, for instance, argue that in building the capacity of, of civil society uh, in situations of, of dysfunctional governance, you're actually playing the very long game in the sense that you aim for societal change. Secondly, um, I would like to bring up the issue of institutional trajectories. Um, you argue that aid practices are decided by decades old institutional rule books and that aid managers really can't break out of that straitjacket, even if they wanted to. Um, but the Swedish example shows that these changes can happen fairly quickly, over a decade or so. So are we really prisoners of, of a trajectory? Doesn't the Swedish example rather say that given political pressure, trajectories can actually change? Um, 
And in your closing chapter, you are not very optimistic about the future of, of, of traditional public sector donors. You suggest that the proliferation of neoliberal governance principles in the global aid system may lead traditional donors to ultimately fall in line. So my final question to you, uh, Simone, is, is this, is neoliberal aid delivery here to stay? Um, now, Simone, in a minute, uh, I will offer you the chance to comment on the reflections provided by uh, Joachim and myself. But first, some instructions to our audience. Um, we welcome your comments and questions. Um, Mats Horsmar at the uh, Airbus Secretariat will assist us in forwarding whatever remarks you have for everyone's benefit. Um, Mats, uh, are there any particular instructions for us? Uh, that's a very simple instruction. Please write your uh, questions and, and comments in the Q&A function in the Zoom program. And I will take care of it to read it to, to the panel. Thanks. I'm over to you, Magnus. Perfect, uh, Mats. You will take care of it. And then, um, Simon, uh, over to you, your, your reflections after hearing Joachim's and my reflections. Yes, thank you very much, uh, both Joachim and Magnus, for, for important uh, responses and, and especially questions. Let me take them in the order they were presented. So I will start with Joachim's question about uh, potential alternative explanations, and so which may lead me to overstate or not account for important uh, factors that that may explain that variation in bypass or engage. And so um, in the cross country analyses, I factor as a control variable, I put I pull in that notion that yes, um, democracy and governance aid does not have the purpose of service delivery, but it is in fact there to promote civil society or changes in governance by even either working with civil society actors um, and or with, with government themselves. Um, if we look at uh, the Swedish data a bit more closely, for, for this to be uh, sort of a uh, an important qualification would mean that uh, Swedish aid uh, or Swedish bypass aid for the purpose of democracy and governance should, could, should go more to poorly governed than um, uh, better governed states. And what we see in the data is actually not, there's not a systematic relationship between the two. So 50% of, of Swedish uh, democracy and governance aid that goes through bypass channels goes through two countries on the higher end of the quality of governance spectrum and the remaining 50% to the low. So there, there doesn't seem to be, or the quality of recipient government governance doesn't seem to play a role. In If we look at the overall aid flows, democracy and governance also is just a proportion of Swedish aid. So it doesn't uh, achieve more than 50. It is it, it, it changes between 20 and 40 percent over time in any given year. But there is still a significant proportion of aid that's not devoted to democracy uh, and governance uh, outcomes uh, that then is systematically conditioned on recipient governance. Um, and as I said, when I look uh, sort of move outside of the Swedish context and across look across donor countries there, I can uh, uh, include it as, as a meaningful control in, in the regressions and the effect holds, okay? Now, uh, I'm very glad you raised the issue uh, or the topic of multi-buy aid or trust fund aid. Um, it also allows me to clarify the definition of my aid delivery of my key dependent variable. Um, and so there, as I said in the beginning, I consider it a, a catch-all category uh, because it groups together actors uh, that are very different, but that 
in a first instance, assume the role uh, of an implementer vis-a-vis -vis the donor agency. And yes, you are correct. A lot of the, the trust funds or even public-private partnerships then deal directly with recipient governments. But Dan Bannock and others have actually closely dissected these, these trust funds and they find that the or uh, and they find that the process uh, through which this relationship between the IO and the recipient is governed is very much dominated by accounting principles and priorities of the donors that then contribute to these delivery mechanisms. And so, yes, I agree, there is a, a, a link to the recipient government, but it is, I think we're too quick to assume that this then represents a significant ownership on the side of the recipient government, because often they're merely dealing with an international organization who then imposes its external uh, accounting systems essentially to ensure accountability and um, do things according to their sponsors or the or the people or the, the the countries that that channel aid through through these uh, new vehicles that have become especially if we look at the multilateral category more broadly, very popular tools um, of, of aid delivery. Um, when it comes to ownership, I fully agree with you. And I think this brings me, I'm going to bring in a bit, uh, and, and please signal me if, I, if I'm too in depth with, with my answers, because we also want to uh, get to the audience. Uh, or potential questions, but but ownership is, I think there's an ideal for ownership. And then there is this idea that that government to government aid at least provides a mechanism for government influence that a bypass mechanism in a first instance does not provide. Now, I'm I, I, I'm not, uh, Magnus said that I was calling the or he was worried I would, would call Germany and France as do-gooders in a first instance, but I don't because they too, right, with their project uh, aid approach, they're not necessarily accounting for ownership the way it is um, uh, constructed as an ideal category. But at least there is a mechanism that allows for, for improvements in that category to, to take place. Um, and, and broadening out ownership to include civil society, I think is, is very important. But as I say uh, throughout the book, um, I think that, that government engagement, we can, we can throw a lot of uh, effort and money and funds towards civil society, but as Afghanistan has recently shown, um, there are also unintended consequences. Right now, uh, the most um, uh, supported actors are actually um, being targeted in in this extreme situation. But but without a functioning state, it's very difficult to to maintain uh, a vibrant uh, civil society. Um, let me take just a couple minutes to respond uh, to uh, Magnus's points. Um, what I don't want people to take away from this uh, presentation is that somehow aid officials are prisoners of a trajectory. There's, I, I don't want to create the impression that uh, I think of aid officials as conveyor, tel conveyor belt type robots that just implement and that don't have any wiggle room. Uh, to promote uh, innovation and change, uh, but rather a trajectory provides an institutional framework mm -hmm. that um, is actually quite broad and where we can think of conservative interpretations of neoliberalism, or we can think of modernizing interpretations of neoliberalism. So managerialism, is, it's not, it, it's, I know it's a controversial term in Sweden, um, but it is, it is in, in many ways, uh, allows for uh, quite a bit of wiggle room. And so, so the recent 
uh, and I'm not perfectly up to date uh, with regard to the last couple, three years in, in Swedish aid because I, uh, my book sort of stops in 2016 with, the, with CEDA and, and the, the aid bureaucracy. But there, the move towards more trusting government, right, within a managerial framework, to me, continues the trajectory, but it, it's becoming more leftist, leftist and modernizing. Um, and so, but 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 the underlying, the fundamental uh, mechanisms like competitive contracting have clear implications for how uh, aid officials uh, will choose their delivery mechanisms. And we can also see this with the uh, non-state actors. I don't treat this in my book, but um, Swedish civil society has received a lot less funding. I looked at the data over the last few years than have bigger, more competitive international NGOs that have the the, the the systems in place to provide monitoring, to provide control uh, over how uh, funds are used. And that is uh, what used to be a, an in intensified partnership between the Swedish government and its civil society is now uh, pushed into the background and goes at the expense of of I think uh, more uh, or Swedish uh, civil society, um, and and I'm going to leave it here. But I can come back into Magnus. You had you had several questions, but I'm just trying to to make sure we have enough time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simone. Uh, I think it's time, Mats, to hear um, uh, what the audience have had to say, and and perhaps you could. Uh, lump together the the questions you've received so far so we take it in one go mm -hmm. uh, thank you I'll, I'll try to do that as, as your uh, approach is a bit new maybe to to uh, to us uh, there are some technical questions uh, for instance uh, Fredrik Ugla asks uh, what if you could say something about how much the um, uh, the explained variance uh, that the bureaucratic model uh, comes with, uh, and are there other possible explanations and effects, uh, such as sector distribution and financing instru instruments? We could think of guarantees, where where versus uh, uh, um, donations. Uh, and uh, also some interaction uh, effects if you have tested for that. And, and there is a question about um, uh, if you have uh, just studied uh, sort of the long-term development aid or, uh, or also humanitarian aid to some extent here. Um, and uh, there is Inge Jeremo who uh, said that uh, there we have... Uh, in the Swedish experience, uh, seen interaction be between the government and civil society uh, as fruitful, uh, but this has um, perhaps not worked in, in some countries such as Zimbabwe. Could you see a way out of that? Um, yeah, uh, and I think Jan Bjerninger has a question here. Uh, uh, um, Climate change prevention and adaptation is, in my mind, a very strong example of the possible conflict between the short-term results and the long-term capacity building. You bring that up very shortly in your last chapter. Could you please elaborate on why you look at it like that? Uh, so there are a few questions uh, going in different directions. Um, Simon, may I ask you to, to try to... Uh give brief uh, comments to, to um, uh, these questions. Um, please, Simon. Yes. Um, so so I, I would have to, in terms of the R square, I think this was what the, what the first question was related. Um, this is, uh, I, I would have to, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have it exactly in my head, but it was, it was in the, the, the typical social science range, like maybe 0.25 or, or something, but I, I would really have to look at the tables and I, I don't have them right now pulled up. 
Um, what I thought was a very interesting uh, comment uh, were re related to uh, the sector distribution. And uh, there, and, and I think that maybe that is what the, what the question has in mind is to what extent is this a sectoral story which applies to say social sector aid rather than aid or economic aid. And, and so for that, um, I have also uh, included uh, statistical controls in, in the regression. And I will say the effects are more substantively meaningful for social sector aid, but the, uh, the, 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 the finding remains robust. That is, as countries become better governed, uh, bypass goes down for donors that condition uh, like Sweden or the neoliberal donors that condition their playbook based on risk in, in aid recipient countries. And so, so, so that is, is cross sectorally, uh, the argument holds. Uh, the question about interaction effect is a really important one and I don't really treat it in the book, but it's I've done analysis and I think it's important because this economic logic that I'm pr proposing, right? Um, it, it, is, it is true across all donors, but if we now interact um, the quality of governance with uh, strategically important donor countries, uh, recipient countries. So if I, for example, if we look at uh, Afghanistan pre-Taliban uh, or during the, the war on terror, it was for the US a very important uh, geostrategic partner. And in those countries, this neoliberal management logic is essentially mitigated by important uh, strategic calculations. So, so when uh, the when the, the 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 logic of economic management is not as strong uh, when we're talking about a small set of very strategically important countries. I have not uh, looked at humanitarian aid uh, in part, or I've excluded it uh, in part because when we look at the delivery um, data, uh, humanitarian aid is predominantly delivered through bypass actors. So I think what would be very neat and useful uh, is to, to think about a disaggregation of my bypass catch-all category and have more, a more differentiated uh, analysis that distinguishes NGOs from uh, private uh, public-private partnerships from for-profit development in uh, the context of humanitarian aid and see whether there is some, some interesting uh, determinants uh, or whether they're linked to, to do, do domestic uh, donor politics. Um, then there was a in question about uh, the interaction between uh, civil society and government. Um, clearly, sometimes um, that doesn't work as planned. And I've mentioned in the early uh, minutes of my presentation when I talked about the unintended consequences of foreign aid that at times, and people other than me have done systematic research on this in highly autocratic countries, governments in fact dis uh, repress uh, externally funded, funded uh, NGOs. And so, so I don't have a solution uh, for this in, in, in the sense that what could be done. But I think uh, rather than um, thinking that civil society can somehow be shaped and formed individually without thinking about how it, it connects and, and fits with uh, government and government uh, capacity and, and uh, government politics is, can be a little bit misleading. So again, as I said, we can promote civil society uh, with, with all our uh, donor funding, but, but if institutions represent bottlenecks and challenges to the expression of 
uh, freedom or women's rights, then then there, we we might not see change. Um, and so um, the when we think fi the final question was uh, was about climate change. Um, in that here, the logic again, climate change can require uh, long-term system-wide changes, right? And this is sort of another theme, uh, I think, of the book or that the book at least discusses is that in order to promote uh, more system-wide changes and not just the, the more targeted and cannibalized targeted, you know, short-term uh, program vision of development, there need to be uh, clear linkages between, you know, what, what objectives or can be accomplished in the short run, which can be linked to outcomes, to good outcomes, to come back to Magnus's question. But they, if we don't, uh, if there is a process that counteracts that link, and it's often nonlinear when we think about development assistant, then we can have uh, short-term success, uh, but we then have these unintended consequences where broader system-wide changes are undermined. And, and finally, uh, let me say that um, a, a focus on, on short-term um, or too much of a focus and not integrating it with longer time, um, more system-wide uh, changes might also make us overlook uh, positive, like a counterfactual, right? So, so projects that in the short run miss in terms of the value for money criteria and, and are shut down prematurely because they don't they don't fulfill the, the necessary success criteria, they might 20 years later very well transform into success. And I know Sweden has, has examples like this in its, in its aid history, um, all other donors have too. And so, so trying to you know, promote more long-term evaluation um, and, 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 and trying to mitigate a little bit sort of the, the the downsides of too much of a managerial focus, I think, would would do uh, development um, very good. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we are approaching the the um, end of this seminar. Yeah. I hope we can uh, have a very quick one on on the issue of of risk and risk management. Um, uh, apparently, neoliberal donors tend to bypass as soon as risks increase. Does that mean that neoliberal regimes, would you say in general, are more risk adverse than traditional ones? Or are they particularly adverse to certain types of risks? Uh, EBA published a study a few years ago on, on CEDAS risk management in fragile contexts, uh, which would lend credibility to that last proposition. It argued that CEDA increasingly tries to be more flexible in some areas, but there is a sort of institutional brick wall when it comes to financial risks, um, which leads to not only bypass, but also strict procedural requirements. In effect, you export uh, the risks to the implementing partner. So one could argue that the present onslaught of this ever-growing army of auditors and controllers is there to help financial risks at arm's length. Would you say that? neoliberal donors are particularly obsessed with financial risks or do different types of donors simply react to risk in different ways? Yeah. Um, you have a long question, but can you do it in a one minute answer? <laughs> I, have, I have two minutes and again, but but it's good because I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna close the circle with some of the things I said uh, responding to Joachim. So, so I think that neoliberal regimes uh, both face fiduciary risk and results risk. And it's that that additional results risk constraint that I think also just pushes uh, neoliberal donors to a more risk averse category. And again, think about sort of the, the, the structure of the bureaucracy shedding light on individual action rather than insulating um bureaucrats or officials in in more 
if in, in, in hierarchies, right, is, is also adding or compounding that, uh, that risk, uh, risk aversions. And in both, ca both cases, um, bypass is appealing. Um, when I talk to practitioners from, from IOs that do trust funds, for example, they all have extra budgetary categories that require them to, uh, to have people in place that do neatly account for project uh, progress and, and success. And so, so, so the uh, international organization in, in, in that context provides that additional layer of accountability uh, that that uh, if you don't have an implementing agency at home that cannot be provided. Now, traditional public sector donors, uh, because they're not uh, using this this or focusing so much on on the short run, and they have the capacity, like Germany or France, to impose very stringent due diligence requirements. They also have the capacity to monitor, right, and to, to hold uh, partner countries accountable. It's not um, perfect. None of these systems really can, can, you know, make this a bulletproof systems, but these, these, are, these are really different approaches to to risk uh, management. And then my last uh, point, but we're already overboard is, is that, you know, this, the, the risk aversion is essentially system driven, right? And it's system induced. And it's not because um, officials in Sweden are more uh, risk averse as individuals, but because the system is, is putting pressures uh, in a way that make them become more risk averse and less ready uh, to to launch or engage with with partners risky partners like recipient governments are thanks uh, thanks simone for uh, shedding light on a very complex issue uh, in a very brief time now um folks this webinar is now coming to a close thank you thank you all for listening and contributing to an interesting discussion on a very important topic. topic. Uh, a particular thank you to you, Simone, for sharing your analysis with thank us, you. and to you, Joachim, for commenting. Um, now, a final word from today's sponsor. Do visit our website, uh, www.eba.se, where you can download our reports, uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter, you can listen to our podcasts, and much more. And you can log on to our next seminar, which will be held on the 10th of March, um, where we will discuss uh, practicing peace building principles in Swedish uh, development cooperation. Uh, bye for now. <laughs>